you're here for the first time, I want to welcome you to this first Sunday of the new year or the, perhaps the first time in a long time. And we are starting by intent, a new sermon series starting today in the book of Acts. We'll be looking through Acts chapter 1 through chapter 10 or so, these next eight weeks together. And to kind of add to that what I call layered learning is that we're going to have a midweek group on Wednesday nights, and perhaps you want to participate, so let us know if you're coming, particularly if you need child care. But uh, it's co-ed, men and women, gathering Wednesday night, and we're using uh, the mini-series AD that came out after Easter last year as, as just to give us a context for the book of Acts. Yes, it is a movie and done by Hollywood producers, but it has some value for us, and so you're invited to come to that. Uh, and we'll, the viewing of the movie starts at 6.30, and then at 7.30, uh, those of you maybe have watched it and don't want to watch it again, uh, then we'll break into our uh, time of discussion. And uh, so we're just going to be talking about uh, what I'm saying here on Sunday morning. Then we'll get a second dose of it on Wednesday night, and I think that will, will be um, what we call layered learning, uh, and you are welcome to attend. The other thing I want to say is look through the worship folder. There's all the announcements that are coming. And uh, some great things happened in, in the last few weeks. One is that uh, right before Christmas, our board, uh, the diaconate, decided to open our fellowship hall to be a winter sanctuary for homeless people. And uh, so tomorrow night is our night. And so uh, from loaves and fishes over 100 people, and it's, it's going to be raining, so we will have a full house tomorrow evening, and our job is to fulfill uh, and, and to feed the folks, and so there's been a menu available. I, I was told 38 people volunteered, and we said we only needed 12. <laughs> How about that? Hallelujah. And then, so that's happening tomorrow night, uh, so I hopefully you, you who signed up uh, will come and show up for the th responsibilities that you made. Uh, then Tuesday morning, we're serving a light breakfast, and then they are back on the bus back to Loaves and Fishes at 6 a.m. And so uh, there's a group of you, a uh, smaller group, <laughs> who have decided to come Tuesday morning. But here's another great thing. We didn't know who would volunteer, and here we got way over 12, and hallelujah for that. Then on Christmas Eve, actually it was the day of Christmas Eve, I thought, you know what? We usually take an offering on Christmas Eve. Why not just say the offering's going to go to Winter Sanctuary to, to feed this 100, 100, 108 people uh, coming? And so, you know what you gave Christmas Eve? Over $600. <laughs> wow. Wow. So that will definitely take care of the food tomorrow night and breakfast. No problem. Uh, and probably... I, I'm going to call her and say, let's see if we can schedule another one, maybe in February and March, depending on the weather. I, I mean, I think the support is here for us, us to do that, and we know there's a need as well. So I want to thank you for your support in all those different ways uh, for Winter Sanctuary. So if you'll come with me now to uh, the message for today, we are in Acts chapters 1 and 2. Uh, I'm not going to read it for you, uh, but... Bring up those texts that are important to us under the topic of power to the people. Uh, and I want to begin with all kinds of power, um, wind power, uh, solar power. How many of you have been approached by someone who wants to sell you a solar system for your home? It's very popular. Hydro power, then there's rocket or engine power that uh, powers our cars and, and other things. And, of course, horsepower, horsepower, and people power. It was a long time ago, and Karen, you found this slide of, of, of someone who got their foot trapped in the subway, and so everybody got out and pushed the car, and the person's leg got out and just fine, and that's the power of, of the people. So we need power uh, to overcome obstacles, to uh, go faster, uh, to generate electricity, to launch rockets, to pull loads, to uh, defeat our enemies. We need power. And personally, we need power to be delivered from those things that give us bondage, uh, those addictions that keep us in their grip. We must find power to, to break those bonds. Well, the book of Acts is all about power, as Dan said. It is about God's power. 
It is about divine power that is promised and delivered to his people and then made available to the entire world. We find the promise in chapter 1, verse 4, where Jesus says, Do not leave Jerusalem in power to be, because that's the way it had always been. With Moses in the tabernacle, you know, the people were led by a pillar of cloud during the day and a pillar of fire at night. And once the tabernacle was built, the, the Shekinah, the power of God dwelt there. I mean, it was the place where people expected God's power to show up and be experienced. But it didn't happen there. It did not happen at the temple. It happened to a dozen or more followers of Jesus gathered in some nondescript room somewhere in Jerusalem as they were praying. You know, if you've been watching the news this week, uh, as I have, uh, the weather has been horrendous in certain places, the blizzards in Texas and Oklahoma, the ice storms and tornadoes, and, and now the flooding the, the Mississippi. And, uh, you know, it's one thing to... to to be at home in the comforts of your living room and watching the weather other places. And, and uh, it's not the same as those uh, news reporters who, who what do they do? They, they go out into the storm. They wade out into the floodwaters and then they report from you from there. And, and that's what we need to do. Uh, let's go into the upper room and let us experience and witness the sights and sounds of divine power as it was poured out upon the followers of Jesus. Clip from the movie. Acts 2, 1 through 4 describes what we just saw and heard. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each one of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled to them. Uh, what an experience. We can visualize it. We can imagine it. And we can make a film about it. But God was doing a great thing. He was doing a new thing. He was transforming his followers in an instant, in an instant. But let's ask the question, why that day? It says it was when the day of Pentecost came that all of this took place. What was Pentecost? Uh, it was, um, penta means five or 50. It's 50 days after Passover. It was an agricultural festival where the farmers had taken their first cutting and then were uh, as part of the festival, brought it to Jerusalem to give God thanks. Thank you for the harvest. Here is our, our first cutting, and we're so excited for it, and we pray now, God, that the harvest would continue and be as abundant as ever. So that was one of the reasons that was happening here on the day of Pentecost, is that a great harvest was just beginning. But Pentecost also marked the time when Moses received the Ten Commandments. Passover was when the Israelites, led by Moses, came out of Egypt, out of their 400 years of bondage. And they passed through the Red Sea. Remember, the Egyptians were chasing them. And 50 days out into the wilderness, they came to what? Mount Sinai. And at the base of Mount Sinai, they camped and Moses was called up to the top of Mount Sinai and he came back with what? The Ten Commandments. So on Pentecost, yes, they were thinking about harvest and God's blessing, but they were also thinking about God giving them a new way of living. Here are my commandments. You are my people. Then follow this and watch how you will be a blessing to the entire world. So that's what was taking place. Um, that God had given them a new way of life and they must now carry out his purposes. Uh, and the Holy Spirit was God's power and presence for, um, for the followers of Jesus to, to carry out the new way of life that Jesus himself had given to them. Uh, a life not based upon uh, law, although 
He said he's going to use the law, but it's now a life of grace and truth. Now, as we saw, these sounds and sights of the Holy Spirit coming upon those first disciples, um, one of the evidences of the power is that they began to speak in tongues or different languages. Um, Here it was not angel talk or uh, heavenly babble. It is very clearly that the disciples were given the ability to speak languages that they themselves had not learned. They were Galileans. They could speak Aramaic. They could speak Greek. They could speak Hebrew. But there were nine different kinds of people there in Jerusalem for this great festival of all kinds of different language groups. And it says that each one of them heard the good and amazing works of God in their own language. And this is highly significant because it shows us that God's intent and purpose in renewing his disciples, the people of Jesus, was that they were then to share the good news to the rest of the world and introduce them to the power that they were just experiencing. You know, we live in a very rapidly changing culture. I I heard just recently that even the news media with their full-time staffs, cannot keep up with our culture because things change so quickly. Uh, We find it, if if maybe you're you're not like me, but I find it difficult just to keep up. (laughs) In fact, I spent one hour watching on New Year's Eve Dick Clark's Rockin' Eve, (laughs) just one hour. And I only recognized one artist (laughs) and none of the songs. And yet all these young people were out there and they knew every song by memory do it. And I said, well, that's not me. <laughs> and I said, well, how do you communicate to this culture that, you know, that, that there exists this, this, this separation between the generations and that we all experience it? And I believe that we struggle. How is it that we can tell the people, even in our oikos, even in the, the circles that we know and, and who know us, how is it that we know what to say and, and how to say it when we, when we talk about God and when we talk about Christ. But here's a hopeful reality in this event, that on the day of Pentecost, God is renewing his followers with fresh energy, and this fresh energy is first of all going to affect their ability to communicate with their culture. Renewed people use words and languages in new ways. This gives me hope. Folks, I would not be in the pulpit today if I could not sit in my office before the script, this, before the Scripture and say, Lord, you know what it meant then. And you know what it means for us today. You know who's coming every Sunday. And you know what they need to hear from me. And you know how it needs to be spoken. That gives me great confidence. That gives me great hope that the Spirit of God can help us connect and communicate to our culture. You see, our culture, though it is a mystery to us, (laughs) it is not a mystery to God. He knows exactly what makes our culture tick. There is no generation gap with God. He knows every generation. He knows exactly how they should be told about Jesus and his work on the cross for them. And so let us celebrate that the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit as his gift to us even today, it is a gift of communication that we can communicate clearly and boldly and effectively as to who Jesus is and what his, he is about and how his followers are to live. That is great hope. Now, moving to number three, let's think about uh, something that has surprised us lately. And uh, this last week I was gone to visit my father-in-law who had some major heart issues and was in the hospital. So we get the sobering news last Sunday from the physician that says, uh, through the surgery that he's had, he has lost his ability to swallow. So we need to put a feeding tube in him. 
Well, his advanced medical director said, directive said no feeding tubes. And so then they said, well, he needs to be released from the hospital and go into some kind of care facility. So on Monday, we did that. We moved him to a hospice care facility. And on Tuesday, guess what? He's feeding himself ice cream. He's swallowing just fine. Chicken noodle soup, drinking water with a straw. The doctor said that swallow would not come back for months, hence the need for the feeding tube. So he surprised us. My father-in-law has surprised us and the doctors. So that was my experience of something that was surprising, and we still are trying to look for an explanation. But that's what took place here. When things surprise us, we want to know, well, what, why, why? How did this happen? What does it mean? And in verse 12, it says, the people were amazed and perplexed, and they asked one another, what does this mean? And then Peter, as the spokesman of the whole group, begins to speak about the meaning of this power, and he uses an extended quotation from the prophet Joel, and it begins this way. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Now, that is a technical term. The last days refers to a period of time. You've heard it like I have. Oh, we must be in the last days. Well, I can tell you for sure, we are in the last days. Because the last days, as a season of time in history, began with the ascension of Jesus into heaven. In chapter 1, verse 11, it says, as he ascended into the heavens, that the angel said, and he will return again. And so the last days is that period of time between Jesus' ascension and his second coming. This is the period of history that we find ourselves in right now. And the coming of the Spirit signals the beginning of the last days. The last days, then, following the prophecy of Joel, will be a season of great instability and uncertainty. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon to blood before the great and coming, uh, coming of the great day of the Lord. So the day of the Lord is the day when Jesus will return to this earth. He is ascended now we are in that period called the last days. And the people who would be listening to these words about blood and fire and smoke and so forth would understand that metaphorically or symbolically, simply saying that during this period of time, again, we don't know exactly how long it will last, there will be unprecedented changes. There will be great instability. There will be cataclysmic worldwide events that happen. Some of them will be new some of them will be troubling as ever before. And I think you could agree with me that uh, we are in such days as in indicated here. Um, and this explains how important it is then for his followers to have the power of the Holy Spirit. Because God knew that during the last days we are going to face unimaginable obstacles and challenges, instability and insecurity like never before, and His people need power. They need His power if we are going to survive and thrive through the period that we are now living in. So we need not to fear because the Holy Spirit has been given and is available to us so that we might survive and thrive during these last days. Not only survive and thrive, but launch new initiatives of good news of God's love to the culture that we live in. The second thing, the third thing we want to say about the last days is that the Holy Spirit will be made available to all. In the Old Testament, the Spirit came. Certainly, the Spirit is, has always been on this earth uh, in part of the creation. But the Spirit came upon prophets and priests and kings individuals for certain things and then departed from them. Here, the promise is that the Spirit was now going to be available to everyone, all genders, all ages, all social classes of people. The Spirit is made available. This promise, Peter says, is for you and for your children and for all who are far off 
for all whom the Lord will call. So the universal uh, availability of the Holy Spirit's power is present. One other thing. In the last days, there will be salvation provided to many. Not all, but to many. Because it says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord during this period of time will be saved. The people need to recognize that they need saving. Not everyone will recognize their need for power. Not everybody will recognize their need for saving. But everyone who does will be saved. N.T. Wright asks us to think about salvation as, as a toboggan ride. Imagine that we are on a toboggan and on a steep slope of snow and we are moving ever quickly as the descent continues and uh, we, are, we are headed for the trees. We are headed for disaster. Uh, and we cannot really stop ourselves uh, headed in that direction. And I don't know about you, but when I was young and we did tube sledding on Mount Charleston in Nevada, uh, who was at the bottom of the hill to catch us before we went over the, the, the dip or into the trees? It was my dad. That's who stood there and kept his little ones from going into, that, into those bushes or to those trees and, and find injury. But this is the way we need to look at salvation, N.T. Wright says, is that as we are on this toboggan moving towards certain destruction, Jesus plants his cross in our way. Amen? And he is the one who says, I'm here. I can stop you. I can save you from your path that is going to destruction. All we need to do is steer his way just a little bit. We need to look to Jesus Christ and his cross and we will be saved. Yes, salvation means certainly to go to heaven when we die, but it also means to have his power to live his life here and now. God saves and renews his people he gives us the Holy Spirit in, the, in, the, in these most difficult times so that we can be His witnesses. And what are we to witness? We are to witness as to who Jesus is. He is the true King of this earth. And He will give us the Holy Spirit so we can communicate that truth wherever we happen to be. So there is now a response to power. And the last point, there is a response to power. It says that when the people heard this, Peter's explanation, they were cut to the heart, cut to the quick, right to the very core of their being. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, what shall we do? And Peter just gives them two steps. He says, first one, repent. Repent. Turn back. Change your mind. You're on a dangerous direction. You're headed downhill. You cannot save yourselves. You need to veer toward the one who can stop you and save you. Repent and look to Jesus Christ as the only one who can save you. Be baptized. Be baptized. Identify public with Jesus. Every baptism was out in public and so forth as well here. And in that baptism we claim that the life and death and resurrection of Jesus is the foundation of our new life. We have the ability not to sin. We have the power to live as he wants us to live. And we die to an old way of life. That's why we immerse. We die. It's a symbol. We die to an old way of life. We are raised up to live a new life with Jesus Christ. We leave behind the old life of slavery. And we are filled with the power to live as God intended us to live. And the good news is that those who accepted his message were baptized and were about 3,000 added to their number that day. Now that's a harvest. And that's the first fruits. That's Pentecost, the first cutting, 3,000. Hallelujah. That means the time of harvest continues even to this very day. So I just ask you, you want to sign up for that? It's the first of the new year. You make resolutions for everything else. Why not make that resolution? Why, why not say, hey, I want to make sure I'm part of God's harvest today.
You have that connection card in front of you in your, in your worship folder. Um, it says on the back, my decision today is that I'm renewing my commitment to Christ or I'm committing to Christ for the first time. Be part of that harvest. It started back then in the day of Pentecost. The power is here. We're in the last days. We're not alone. We can live as God wants us to live right here and right now. So use your card and make your decision today. Lord, we thank you again for this time as we begin uh, this study of the book of Acts with the power of the Holy Spirit. And yes, it was dramatic and, and all of that, and yet your Spirit comes too uh, as a still small voice sometimes. And so, Lord, minister to each person here today. Have them look upon their own life and to see where it is they need your power and what challenges are before us as individual Christians and as, uh, as a church. Uh, we are not left alone. Uh, we will not be orphaned. You have given us your Holy Spirit because in these times, we know, you know we need Him. And so hear the prayers of your people now as we think and meditate and make this new commitment for this new year. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm-hmm.